My name is Gloria Bai, and I come from Shanghai, China. Currently, I'm the s a supply chain management student at MIT. Excellent. Yeah. My name is Luisa, and I'm from Brazil. Um, I'm a master's student in Brazil. I'm a full-time student, and my field of research is in humanitarian logistics. Fabulous. My name is uh, Christian Bautista. I'm coming from the program in Spain, originally from Mexico, and uh, being, I'm working in the oil and gas industry for the last six years. Beautiful. My name is Amin. I'm from Tunisia. I'm um, doing the master program, full time master program in Malaysia. And I have an engineering background in nano and biotechnology. And uh, yeah. Lovely. So, so, by way of introduction, you know I'm Kevin Smith. <laughs> and you, and you, you know that I've been involved in supply chain for the last 40 plus years. And uh, got involved in supply chain completely by accident. It was a full-time job for me working at night unloading freight cars when I was going to college. And uh, thought it would, I would do that until I found out what I really wanted to do with my life. And I guess I'm still looking because, <laughs> I, because I've been involved in it all of this time. But it's a wonderful career because it covers the entire spectrum of the enterprise. So I think you've all made wonderful choices in terms of the direction you're taking your careers. But what questions can I answer for you specifically? For sure. Um, I want to ask a question for your just introductions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for me, my experience also act accidentally is to yeah, work in supply chain management because my major in my undergraduate stu uh, school is material science and engineering. But then I joined the company for the procurement and right now I really want to pers uh, persuade my career uh, path is especially focus on supply chain management. So based on um, your experience, I really want to know could you please share your successful stories and what's the qualification for us to prepare to be a very good supply chain candidate? Oh, well, for, that's a fantastic yeah. question. And, and first of all, I'd say uh, just getting involved in some aspect of supply chain. So for instance, procurement mm -hmm. is one major component of supply chain today. Supply chains and big companies tend to go all the way from procuring raw materials all the way through to the consumer. So if you're involved in one part of supply chain, there's no reason you can't branch out. and and find other parts of the supply chain that you'd be interested in participating in. Mm -hmm. uh, the beautiful part of it is that no matter what part of supply chain you're involved in, you have an opportunity to affect the bottom line of the company that you're working with. Mm -hmm. So as you start in procurement, you know my advice would be look throughout the supply chain. Look at transportation and distribution and maybe even the marketing aspects of supply chain to figure out what are the other things that I think I could make a positive impact on based on what I know today? As you said, we got involved in this by accident. I, I, nobody woke up one day when they were a teenager and said, boy, I really want to be a supply chain manager. That's not just not the way it works. We get involved in businesses, and then we find out what we're good at and what we want to participate in. Now, I think that being a supply chain manager is also an excellent jumping off point to the C-suite. Mm -hmm. CFO, COO, CEO of a company. Because once you've understood what happens throughout the entire company, from procurement all the way through to the consumer, mm -hmm. you've got a much better idea of what the enterprise is going to do. Mm. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, so my question is, of course, about the humanitarian logistics. <laughs> so I, s I think I saw something about the Red Cross and, and you, no? Yeah. Okay, so, so my question is actually uh, if you feel that, um, or how you feel that non-oriented humanitarian companies, like just regular business companies, can help the humanitarian sector um, in providing better response to disasters. Okay. Well, you know, if in terms of providing humanitarian efforts or just being involved socially, uh, many companies make an, a real effort to do this. They want to be socially responsible. They want to participate. So, for instance, I was the chairman of the Red Cross for Rhode Island, for the state of Rhode Island, uh, while I was working at CVS. Now, CVS supported that because, you know, we were a major player in the community. There was no reason for us not to. Now, it's a personal decision, of course. If you, uh, individuals have to want to do this. They have to want to get involved in humanitarian efforts. I personally deal with a lot of nonprofits today. I mean, this is when I retired from full-time corporate work, this gave me an opportunity to do a lot of things that I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So uh, I've worked with the Red Cross. 
I've worked with Allen, which is the American Logistics Aid Network, part of CSCMP, it's spawned off of CSCMP. So we're doing a lot of work with Haiti, for instance, uh, after the earthquake. We're coming up on the fifth anniversary, fourth anniversary of the earthquake now in Haiti. Uh, still a lot of work to be done. Most companies want to be socially responsible. They want to have a presence in organizations like the Red Cross. As an individual, I think it's up to you, though, to go to your, your manager, your supervisor, the CEO, and say, would it be okay if I participated in this as a representative of our company? But I think it's a wonderful thing to do, but it's a very personal decision, and by the way, it takes a lot of time. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I think I'm next. So um, I am a, a member of the APIX, so one of your uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> partnership competitors. It's room for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so and so far, I, can, I mean, I got certification from the, from them, and I still I don't I feel that they are kind of uh, behind in terms of education, and I don't know how uh, your organization is trying to come up or try to update those uh, online courses, online training. And in, if in the near future you're looking for some alliances with, I don't know if you know about Can Academy, this is online site that you can get education. I'm, I'm not familiar with them. Okay, so well, well some sort of uh, education online. So uh, are you planning to maybe look for allies I mean, in order to expand your uh, organization in terms of online? Well, you know, w one of the major items of interest, I think, among supply chain managers, especially emerging supply chain managers, is how can I demonstrate to my company, how can I demonstrate to other people that I'm proficient at what I do? So Apex for years has had their certification program, which is aimed primarily at inventory. Now I'm gonna put in a shameless plug here for CSCMP, because as the chair-elect for CSCMP, I can tell you we've developed a, uh, a program for certification, which is in three elements, a basic certification, uh, a more extensive certification, and a, more of a case study certification program. And we're, we're re actually really welcoming people who've been involved in Apex because inventory is a major component of what you do in supply chain. But there's so much more, as we discussed before, from procurement all the way through to the consumer. There's so much more to learn. So we've actually put together a certification program which is based on uh, an eight book series. We've published eight books that cover all of the primary aspects of supply chain and then we ask people to take the certification test and you know see if they actually are proficient. Uh, I think it's a great thing, you know, whether it's CSCMP or somebody else that does it, I think it's a great way for people in the industry to demonstrate to their companies that they actually know what they're doing. Because, you know, it, let's face it, most CEOs don't understand supply chain. Most CFOs don't understand supply chain. So if you can say, I'm certified, and by certification that means that I've taken a course of study and I've taken the test and this organization, this major organization really understands supply chain has said, I know this stuff. I think that's a good thing. Now, I'll also say this, as you're going through this process, make friends with the CFO, make friends with the CEO. And by that I don't mean, uh, you know, just, you know, suck up to them. Mm -hmm. I mean, demonstrate to them the value that you bring to the company demonstrate to them the things that you can do that affect the bottom line and therefore give them a boost on the top line to the company. And certification is one of those things though that really demonstrates that you know what you're doing. So I'd encourage you to continue that. And I'd encourage you to get with CSCMP and get certification. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, my, my question is, um, we have on the supply chain business, we have for many components of the supply chain, we have different um, metrics for the, to, uh, to assess our performance. Mm -hmm. Do we have a per performance metric for the whole supply chain? I mean, some metrics like that can give us more insight on what's going on on the whole supply chain, from the supplier or material until the, and the consumer. So I think it's one part, it's really difficult to assess to for, for the whole supply chain. So <coughs> what do you think about it, according to your experience, of course? I'm, you know what, I'm happy to talk about this because it's something I'm, I'm very passionate about. When it comes to metrics, I think that historically we've tried to measure too much. Okay. So uh, when, when you start to do a metrics program, first of all, it has to be very specific. Mm -hmm. Not to, If you try to measure everything in the whole supply chain, you're going to get overwhelmed. Yep. So the metrics have to really focus on the things that really drive your business. And more likely than not, they're probably going to be things that are specific to a particular supplier, partner, or you know, 
relationship. And I would say, and I tell this to people all the time, pick five or six things that you really think are important and focus on those. Now, if your partners are consumer goods manufacturers and you're a retailer, those metrics, those five or six might be different for each one of your partners, slightly different. Mm -hmm. Some things are always going to be the same. Do you deliver on time? Do you, you know, yep. do, do you deliver complete orders? Those are things that are generally important. Uh, but I'll tell you, in the past, I've been involved both in the manufacturing life and in the retail life where we had just too many metrics. You know, at, at one point, I remember sitting down with our partners and we had a standard metrics program for all suppliers. There were 70 things we were measuring, 70. It was too much. It would take a half a day to get through it, and at the end you'd say, did we actually move the business forward, or did we just find a new way to punish our supplier? So metrics should not be used for punishment. They should be used to help you drive your business to higher levels. Pick five or six things and focus on those. And it makes it difficult to make a decision if you have too many uh, metrics. And so You get lost. You get lost in the data. And once you start to get lost in the data, you lose sight of what's really important. So you know, you, if you're in a business, what you want to do is you want to control costs, you want to boost profits, you want to improve your margin. So what are the five or six things you can measure with a particular partner yeah. that help you do those things? Whether you're a supplier or a retailer or a wholesaler, et cetera, it doesn't really matter. Okay. What are the five or six things that are really important? I think there is a quote from Einstein that says, uh, not everything that not everything that matters can be counted, and not everything that matters can, uh, not everything that counts can be ma matters. Albert Einstein. Yes. Not everything that counts can be counted. Not everything that can be counted counts. Yeah, that's <laughs> He's my hero, and I <laughs> actually <laughs> I have that slide in almost every presentation I make. Actually, I'm glad you brought it up. <laughs> Great. Okay. Uh, I have another question. Follow my previous ones. I really love your answer, and it's based on my experience. Um, after seven or more than seven years working experience, I realized, okay, I really love the supply chain, so that's why I applied for this program. But I also realized what my weakness, um, based on the previous experience, for example, is too narrow in just one area of the whole supply chain. And I lack of the quantitative analysis skills, I lack of the end-to-end -end understanding knowledge of the supply chain, so that's why I come here to learn more knowledge and uh, skill sets. However, um, so at that time, at the beginning, I also think, okay, my future career goal maybe can expand and jump out of the box. Maybe not just focus on the procurement, also can think about the planning, the forecasting, and even the logistic inventory. However, in the real world, I realize that if I want to change or switch my career, it's not easy because company always want to make the mar make the profit and uh, focus on the margin. So currently I really have sometimes to confusing my career goal. How can I to prepare for the future career? And I really want to expand my yeah, career instead of just to focus on the procurement. Okay. Yeah, so what's your suggestion? First of all, you're getting yourself a fantastic education which is much broader than your current experience. So, that, that, so you have to advertise that. And by advertising, I mean you need to talk to uh, your supervisor, your manager, your company, and tell them what you want to do. Now, this sounds easy. I'm going to tell you. When I was running big companies, I loved it when somebody came to me and said, you know, I'm in procurement, but I'd really like to understand how the distribution system works. I'd say, that's fantastic. We can make that happen. Mm -hmm. Let's make it part of your development plan to do that. You know, we can put you there for six months, or we can make a complete change, and you can work for distribution for a year or two, mm -hmm. and, you know, we'll, then we'll see if that's what you want to do or if there are other things you want to do. I think it only helps a company to have people come forward and say, I want to do more. I want to understand more. I want to contribute more to the, to the enterprise. And people who stay in their little silo of understanding the people who, who it, first of all, I guess you know, I'm being mean. There's nothing wrong with that. If somebody wants to be a procurement manager for their entire career, I guess that's okay. It wouldn't have worked for me. I, you know, I wouldn't have wanted to do that. I wanted to know more. I wanted to experience more. I wanted to control more. Maybe control <laughs> is, the, is the real issue. But uh, just talk to them and tell them that you have an interest in expanding what you do. I would be shocked if they said, oh no, you have to stay in procurement forever. Uh, any good manager is going to say, let's make that part of your development plan and let's make sure that you get exposure to that. And by the way, you might find out you don't like it. You might find out that 
procurement is really where you want to be. Yeah, you're right. And I also need to choose a good company can give me these development opportunities. <laughs> well, and that's true. And you know, th this is a good point for everybody. Mm. Uh, when you're interviewing for a job with a company, interview the company as well. Mm. Because uh, this goes for not just for supply chain. If you get up in the morning and you say, oh good, it's time to go to work, that's a good thing. If you get up in the morning and say, oh god, it's time to go to work, that's a bad thing. You have yeah. to find something that you're happy doing in order to be really successful. You'll never be the best person you can be if you don't enjoy what you do. I never had a day when I went to work and I said, boy, I really hate this. I got, I got to a point where I said, there are other things I want to do and therefore I'm going to retire and because I wanted to do more work with nonprofits. I wanted to do, uh, you know, work with organizations that were trying to improve either uh, supply chains to remote parts of the world or, or help the Red Cross locally. That, those are all good things. But when you're in a company, be the best you can possibly be. And if you don't enjoy what you're doing, find something else to do. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Well, so I think I'm going to follow Gloria's line in this mm -hmm. <laughs> because um, my, I'm in, for undergrad school, I, I did civil engineering. So I'm a civil engineer and I was working with um, structural design. And I was designing ports and when I would look at a, a, a port, I would say, God, this layout is so more, so more interesting than what I am doing. So I got interested in logistics because of that. Mm -hmm. And I decided to uh, go back to the university and pursue a master's degree that, that has to do with logistics. So now I'm at this point that I'm finishing my master's, but I don't really know where to start. You know, what company, uh, what kind of company I should start. And I wanted to be in a company that actually uh, gives me opportunities, like you mentioned, to see every part of, of the chain kind of, uh, get to know every little part of it. But um, I think my question is, what suggestion did you give to me uh, on how to look for a company? How to, how to um, where should I start, well, you know? Uh, first of all, I'd say you first, you, you've already really narrowed the field because you want to be involved in logistics and supply chain. That's great. I'll tell you this, I never knew throughout my career, I don't think, what my next job was going to be. And when I did know what my next job was going to be, sometimes I didn't care for that and I'd try to steer away from it. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one of the reasons that I left uh, Kraft. I was with General Foods and Kraft for 25 years. Mm -hmm. I knew what my next job was going to be and I didn't want to do that. Mm -hmm. I, had already, I had already tasted the bigger scope of logistics, building networks, and that's, that's what I wanted to do. So I, mean, I think I was in a similar position to you. Mm -hmm. um, I, if you don't know what you want to do long term, it doesn't really matter what company you get involved with, as long as you get involved with a company that you feel comfortable with. And you'll know when you interview with a company, you'll get a feel for you know, whether or not there's a mental match and whether you're comfortable there. And if you're not comfortable, don't do it. You know, even if they offer you a huge amount of money, don't do it. Because money is not going to make you happy in the long run. In the long run, you're going to be happy if you're doing things that you really enjoy with people that you enjoy. So check out the company first. You can look online a lot of times. You can look at the annual reports for most of these companies and get a feel for what it is they do. If you're uncomfortable with it, move on to something else. The other thing you could do is you could talk to people either in the company or in the industry. This is where organizations like CSCMP, I think, become very valuable mm -hmm. because uh, if you remember CSCMP, we could connect you with people probably in that company mm -hmm. or in companies that deal with that company. And you could get a feel for whether or not it's someplace that people are comfortable or whether they feel threatened yeah. or, you know, some companies you just don't want to work for. And it's much better to find that out before you go there mm -hmm. than after you go there. So I, I think you're on the right track. And by the way, I was an English major. Right, yeah. so so I had no idea what I, I, what I wanted to do was I wanted to teach in the public school system, but I was making four dollars and sixty three cents an hour, in a union job unloading freight cars at night. That's about ten thousand dollars a year. That's what I was going to make as a public school teacher. Ten thousand mm -hmm. dollars. That just tells you how old I am. All right. <laughs> so uh, although they probably don't make much more than that today, when I 
I got an offer to become a foreman in the warehouse for fourteen thousand dollars. Well, that was a forty percent raise in pay right there, <laughs> and that was what encouraged me to stay. And then from there on, I just I got opportunities to try different jobs. The companies that I was with, though, Louisa, were wonderful. I enjoyed the companies. I enjoyed the people. And the day that you don't enjoy it, then you have to start thinking about what am I going to do next? Where do I want to go next? You're welcome. <laughs> Kevin, um, the next one I'm going to stay with the uh, with the your organization you're currently with. Um, my my question is going to be, what is the worldwide expansion? So, do you have any plans? I mean, like try to go further if more countries. And I mean, I know it's online. To so CSMP again, you're asking about. Mm -hmm. Well, we're ac actually already a global organization. We have uh, we have roundtables in. Oh gosh, I should know this off the top of my head. I don't know. We have about 104 roundtables right now okay. around the world. The majority of them are in the U.S., but we have a number of roundtables in Europe, India, uh, Africa, uh, Australia, so uh, South America. So th there are roundtables all around the world right now. We should make them more robust. And the other thing that we really need to do is make sure that the people who participate in the roundtables become members of CSCMP because that's how they get the most benefit out of participating. So it's one thing to go to a round table once and hear a message. Mm -hmm. uh, if you get something good out of that, if you, if you enjoy it, then that should encourage you to become a member of that organization and get more of the message, have more access to the education, mm -hmm. to the information that's available. But it's already a global organization. Uh, we have run conferences. We run the annual global conferences always in the U.S., mm -hmm. but we have run conferences in Europe, uh, Asia, in the past, uh, it's, har it's hard for us to do. Uh, <clears throat> when you expand to Europe, you know that the EU is the EU in name only, right? I mean, it's, yeah. it's really 40 plus countries who all want to act completely independently, mm -hmm. but they have a common currency. Uh, it's very difficult to create a kind of a, a, an EU conference where you attract everybody. If we go to Germany, we attract Germans. Mm -hmm. Uh, and maybe, you know, maybe some people from the Netherlands. Uh, if we go to France, we get French people. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, but, and maybe somebody from Luxembourg, you know, Benelux. But uh, it's, di it's become more difficult for us to do Europe, but we're working hard to figure out how we create that value proposition so that people want to participate. And we'll probably try to expand more over time into Europe. But we are a global organization today, and you can take advantage of the, all the global activities that go on. Yeah, that's going to be my next question. I mean, how do you customize or tailor the, the programs for each region of the world? But I mean, you, you already got it. <laughs> uh, how do we cover it? Yeah, no, no. I mean, you already, you're already, you're already answered my question because I was oh, going to ask. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Very good. I like to pre-answer the question so, yeah, so yeah, we, yeah. Save, we save time that way. <laughs> yeah, my question is, um, I know during, during uh, the whole ca career, for example, for in the store, uh, when, you manage, when you have to manage uh, stores um, for CVS, for example, at what time, um, because now with the Internet of Things, with all uh, the data, big data, everything, so I think, I guess, one logical thing to do for any business is to think about e-commerce. And uh, so my question is, um, if you have to think about it and you have to apply it, how, what makes the, um, what drives your decision to move to e-commerce and apply it in a Real, uh, in the real business. Okay. Uh, so. Well, first of all, I want to yeah. clarify. I didn't run the stores. I ran the operations that went up the to the stores. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, because uh, I don't want some store manager to come back and, <laughs> and yell at me saying that I took his job away. But uh, your question is a wonderful question in today's environment because it's not just e-commerce, it's omni-channel, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. everybody wants to get their product everywhere. Uh, they want to get it online. They want to get it in store, traditional brick and mortar. They want to. They want to have every opportunity, every different opportunity to get product. Now, some people like to go to a store and pick things up and feel they're very tactile. They say, "Well, this is what I want to buy." Other people might say, "I don't care." Some people like to go to the store the first time. For instance, if uh, you know, if you like a particular kind of gloves from a particular manufacturer, you'd want to go to the store the first time and say, "Well, this is really what I like." It fits well. Now I can buy them online. I don't have to go back to the store. Okay, that's all right too. So omni-channel, the idea that everybody that sells stuff has to come up with a way to service all of their customers, either in a, in a store environment, online, or some other way, uh, you know, direct to consumer. 
these are these are all things that every company has to consider. So at CVS, we had a very active e-commerce business. Okay. Okay. So, and it's uh, it's not a matter of do you want to do it? You have to do it you to because do it. you risk losing customers. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, we're going to see uh, a lot of change in the way this happens. Exactly the impact on the supply chain. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Does, are you familiar with Tesco, the uh, the, yeah. the British retailer? They, yeah, well, yeah. in uh, yeah. Korea, mm -hmm. they've instituted a new program in the subway system, which is incredible. Oh, yeah. They've put pictures of the products on the wall in the subway oh, stations yeah. Yeah. with the with the with the barcode. Mm -hmm. People get off the subway, they use their smartphone to take a, a picture of the product that they want, upload it, and the product is delivered to their home. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is an incredible yeah. idea. Yeah for omnichannel because now you've got people who are very busy you know they're working long days or they don't have time to shop this is giving them another channel and it's a very unique channel uh, there's another there's a retailer in the UK called John Lewis who is taking home delivery and last mile delivery to a, a new uh, level they have took the idea a couple of years ago uh, working with a company called Descartes Systems and they said do our customers really want next day delivery? Because this is what everybody thinks everybody wants next day delivery. Yeah. Or do they want convenient delivery? And so what they did was they, they created a program where they'd say to their customer, okay, we understand you want it. When do you want it? They'd say next day. They'd say, do you really want it next day or is there a time this week that you'd really like to have it? They said, well, Thursday afternoon at three o'clock would really be perfect because that's when I get yeah. home from work or I pick up the kids from school. So they said, fine. So they've created a program where they're now able to, instead of doing this hurry, 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 next day delivery, plan deliveries, which means that, first of all, we haven't talked about sustainability, but it makes them more sustainable because they can get better utilization of their trucks. Mm -hmm. But it also allows them to not have to go to that very expensive you know, emergency shipment plan. They can plan their shipments, mm -hmm. and I think this is going to be the, the wave of the future. Mm -hmm. Everybody thinks right now that it's got to be next day or same day. That's not necessarily true. Yeah, yeah. If I'm buying something, it's very rare that I need it today. Mm -hmm. If I need it today, I'm probably going to go to the store. Yeah. But if I need it tomorrow, do I really need it tomorrow or do I need it a couple of days from now? Sure. And it makes it much more affordable for everybody. Mm -hmm. Last year, uh, here in the U.S., we had a situation at Christmas time mm -hmm. with FedEx and UPS where a lot of the online retailers were saying Seriously. buy it Monday and you'll have it by Tuesday for in time for Christmas when the whole system almost collapsed so you're familiar with this I'm sure it's been a case study you've used and at that point this was the canary in the coal mine if you will this was a warning shot for us to understand how this business is going to continue to go. This year they did a much better job with it. And the way they did a better job with it, I believe, is UPS and FedEx and DHL went to their retailers and they said, we can't do this again. It's, it's, it's going to hurt your business, it's going to hurt our business. Yes. So don't be promising free next day delivery with a one day mm -hmm. window. And they didn't and everything went much smoother. Mm -hmm. So these are the things we learn. These are the things the supply chain is responsible for. And while the the normal citizen, the person who's not involved in supply chain, all they know was they were mad last year because they didn't get their, mm -hmm. their product in time for Christmas. Uh, this year they didn't notice. So <clears throat> congratulations to all of us for doing a good job of fixing that. Yeah. We may never get the credit for it, but it's what we do. Yeah. So basically, the, what is the main impact, I mean, uh, on applying the e-commerce, the main impact on the uh, supply chain? I mean, you have the logistics part to manage, the de delivery part. Okay, I mean, well, the, 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 the main impact? Yeah, the main well, impact. Okay, so the, the biggest thing you have to consider is how am I going to do this? So omni-channel is a fine, is a great term. Mm -hmm. But what you have to remember is everything has to ship from someplace. Yeah. It doesn't ship from the Ethernet. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, it yeah. has to ship physically from someplace. So mm -hmm. people who are involved in uh, multi-channel delivery, multi-channel businesses, have to figure out how am I going to handle that. So. Am I going to house the product that I put in my brick and mortar stores in the same distribution mm -hmm. center as my e-commerce? Okay. Or am I going to set up a completely different facility? Am I going to outsource that business to someone else? Mm -hmm. these, these are all questions that you have to answer okay. for yourself. And again, I would say that uh, 
supply chain management professionals play a huge role in this. It's mm -hmm. not just marketing, because the supply chain management professionals have to figure out where does that inventory need to be, how much do we have to have, and you know what's the safety stock that's involved. So mm -hmm. all the things we talked about, you know, you need a forecast and e-commerce yeah. especially. There's absolutely no way to forecast e-commerce. Anybody can sit down at a computer any time of the day and say, I want that. Uh, it's, it's much easier to predict your sales in a store where you open at nine o'clock in the morning and you close at nine o'clock at night because you can, over time you can predict how many people are gonna come in. E-commerce, very hard to predict. So, so what's your inventory situation gonna be? And are you gonna keep it all in one building or are you gonna split it up into the different channels? Personally, I'm a proponent of keeping it all in one building because I think there's an opportunity to share inventory there mm -hmm. that you don't have if you split it into different buildings. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Because today's uh, market is really amazing. It's not only for the innovations market, but also the integrations market. Okay, yeah. So I also very, yeah, I, I feel very excited for the future because as you said, it's really a merch channel. And I also heard that they have a lot of new technology to make our dreams to come true. For example, like you said, we can share in the inventory. Even I heard some pro projects in China happened as they try to put some inventory uh, from the big retail company to the supermarket near the community. And the people, the community persons, they can uh, pick up their um, shopping things from the supermarkets. So the network is really sharing currently. It's amazing. This is, <laughs> this is the beautiful thing about supply chain is it always changes. And we're the people that have to figure out how that change is going to affect the businesses that we work for. Yeah. So uh, again, I applaud you for selecting this as your career. <laughs> I don't think you'll be okay. disappointed. I think it can be very rewarding both mm -hmm. mentally and financially. Mm -hmm. And I'll look forward to working with all of you in the future. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Louisa. Thank you so much.